Today's podcast is another episode in our Game Plan for Your Next Job series. It's a time of year where we start looking at some of the opportunities that are there for us. And joining me today to discuss uh, some of those key things in helping you get your next job is Brian Rezepa, who is the author of You're Hired, A Guide to Working in Sports. Brian, thanks for taking the time to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Keith. So for our listeners, Brian, if you would please, just share a little bit about uh, your background and especially your experience as it relates to the resource you've developed. Yeah, so uh, my undergrad degree was in sports management. And throughout the time that I was going through that degree, and then after I had actually uh, gotten it, you know, I'd worked in minor league baseball, so I worked in communications, media relations, things like that. And then um, in addition to working in minor league baseball, it also have worked as a journalist for quite some time. And throughout both of those kind of paths, I've um, you know had the opportunity to meet quite a few different people and develop different connections. And so I guess, you know, from my standpoint, just kind of looking to work in sports at the time, um, you know, I kind of wanted to learn how to, you know, advance within the field up to these top jobs that you see, you know, top of the coaching world, top of, uh, you know, the, the backside of the business side with athletic directors or general managers. And so, um, you know, I just kind of set out and started talking to people and ended up talking to about 17 people that were, have worked at the highest level of sports. And, you know, it came together. And I think that it'll be a great resource for, uh, you know, people looking to work within the industry or just kind of interested in um, how all of it works on the back end. Yeah, I think a, a big part of this for you was tapping into uh, your network and, and networking in being able to advance yourself in any career is such an important part of it. But uh, talk to us a little bit, especially as it relates to football, some of those people who you networked with to be able to get some insight into this topic. Yeah, so I think obviously the, the name that would really jump off the page uh, to football fans or to football coaches is um, Phil Fulmer, the former uh, longtime coach of the University of Tennessee and uh, now the athletic director at the University of Tennessee. But in addition to him, um, you know, you've also got Ken Herrick, who is a he worked in the NFL and player personnel for, you know, decades. And then beyond them, we have some coaches at the uh, D1 collegiate level, um, some athletic directors, Scott Strickland, John Cohen um, at the D1 athletic level with uh, major SEC programs. So I think uh, kind of the, the broad variety uh, of coaches and athletic directors kind of does really would really serve as a, as an asset to uh, to football coaches. And certainly, uh, if our listeners are interested in this, um, we'll give them some information on how to get the book. You're hired a guide to working in sports, but you know, right away you go to into a key part of this whole thing. I mean, if you're going to get a job, first thing you need to do is land an interview. So, what advice do you have for coaches out there about landing their interview? So I think, especially coming out of the gate, you know, uh, with young coaches, there's so much competition within the field. And, you know, I'm sure, as you know, Keith, you're, you're looking at going into opportunities where you're either not going to make very much money at all, or you might not make anything. You might have to volunteer for a while. So I think that that's a mindset that you have to, you know, accept going in, you know, maybe you'll have to work a job on top of coaching, something like that. But you know, if you're really committed to it and, you know, are looking to kind of advance within the field and get your start within the field, it really just comes down to starting to lay those groundwork, lay the groundwork of your network. You know, a lot of these co early entry level coaching roles, it's not going to be, you're not going to be, uh, you know, drawing up plays, scheming, things like that. So you're going to be going in and, uh, you know, doing some of like the grunt work and uh, maybe some of the lesser uh, ideal roles, but you know, I think that especially within the coaching community, with how relationship based it is, a lot of people are super willing to help and they know that, you know, he, they were helped on their way to start. So, you know, just reaching out to coaches and seeing, you know, what value you could provide to them uh, is definitely a great start to, to getting your own start. And by going through that, you know, you start to kind of grow the early uh, the early foundation of your network, which I'm sure uh, we'll talk about later, how crucial it is to develop that network. But yeah, I think that that's probably a, a good start to kind of landing that first interview of that entry level role. You said an important thing there in regards to networking, and I truly believe this, that uh, if you really want to develop the relationships that are going to make a difference to you, um, whether that's right now or down the road, 
It's not about figuring out who can do something for me. It's about figuring out who can I do something for, right? And, and taking on, you know, that uh, servant leadership role and being able to figure out um, what can I provide? What value do I have that would be useful for, to this particular person or to this particular organization? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that that's, you know, something that I've heard quite often in speaking with coaches, even outside of speaking uh, with them for the book. But, you know, I think that a lot of what um, goes wrong, I guess, in early co- younger coaches trying to develop their network is that they look at it as more of a transactional basis, where I think that if you go into it with a more genuine, uh, I guess, mindset of, you know, looking to help them and not necessarily expecting something back. I think that that can be much more fruitful for developing an actual relationship. And, you know, that's what's going to be key to advance your career. You know, maybe helping out this particular coach is not going to, you know, take you to that next step in your career, but, you know, developing that experience of helping them and learning the different skills that, you know, you can from just working around different, uh, from different people, that's going to be crucial. And even beyond that, you know, you never know who, Um, someone knows. So, you know, while this particular person might not be able to help you directly, they might know someone. And if you do, if you reach out to them and do a good job with them and help them out, you know, the the word will spread eventually. That that's exactly it, right? If you're doing right for people and you're good at what you do, uh, that word will get out. And, you know, even in, in looking at this whole process, you know, at, at the end of this, you very well may not get a job that you had landed the interview for, prepared for well. You know, you might not get it. But a lot of times, you know, going back to those athletic directors and the, and the people who are sitting down with you in that interview process, uh, a lot of times you, you may have still impressed them enough that they're passing that word along in their network that, hey, this is a guy who might be of interest to you. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's really the, the key of it too. And I think that, you know, not to, not to spoil my book here, but uh, in the first chapter, I spoke about a coach, Stacy Collins. He's now uh, the defensive coordinator at Utah state in division one football. And, uh, you know, the first job that he had taken as a defensive coordinator at the collegiate level was in 2002 with the South Dakota school of mines. And so, you know, you wouldn't necessarily associate that with, Oh, this, this glamorous prestigious job. But, you know, as he kind of made his way throughout his career, eventually, 10 years later, he ended up being the head coach of the South Dakota School of Mines. And, you know, as you'll find out in chapter one, it was largely based on the connections that he had made, um, you know, within the athletic department at the time there. So, you know, I guess, you know, you never really want to burn bridges and you want to build as many bridges as possible because you never know, you know, what's going to eventually lead you back to where, where, you know, a particular connection could lead you. So, Brian, as as you start going through this process, preparing for that interview is a, a critical part. And, you know, we've we've had some experts on and, and talk about that. There's a lot of research that really goes in. If you really want that job, uh, you better understand a lot about that organization, a lot about the people there. Uh, there is a lot of prep work that goes into it and not just sharing who you are, but understanding how you might fit into that organization what advice do you have for uh, coaches who are you know they've they've got that job they landed the interview now uh, it's prep time yeah so i think that this is again where another another portion where your network is going to come in to, is going to come in handy you know some of the athletic like athletic directors i had spoken to um you know they had relied on their contacts within uh their particular conference um to see i guess to get some backgrounds as far as the I guess the organizational culture of the uh, inter- of the organization that they were going to interview with, um, just things like that. It's just a good way to get some some more insight and, and opinions of this potential workplace that you'll be going into. Um, beyond that, you know, one of the bigger things that I had heard again throughout speaking with the different coaches was that uh, you know you need to be continually developing your coaching portfolio. So you know, looking at things like not only beyond like your practice. Uh, practice drills and uh, different strategies on the field, you know, you need to look at your different core beliefs and, you know, really evaluate internally, you know, what's important to you out of a job and out of an organization that you're going to work within. And, you know, as you kind of go throughout that process and you look into these different interviews and go into these different interviews, 
you know, you really need to treat these things with two way conversations. It's not just the organization asking you questions. You know, you need to learn if it's a good fit for you. And, you know, you're going to determine if it's a good fit by, again, continually reevaluate, reevaluating your different values and beliefs. And I think that, you know, just that combination of things, just working on your portfolio, kind of treating it as a two way street, you know, I think that that's going to be huge for you moving forward. And I guess providing, um, you know, that potential success even beyond the interview. We've had a lot of coaches in, in talking about the jobs they've taken over uh, the years about finding the right fit and really knowing what the right opportunity is. I know that's something that you touch on here as well. Um, what insight do you have into that topic? Yeah, and I think that that is going to be just going throughout uh, that interview prep process. It's going to be finding that right fit. And again, you know, looking to see how this organization values, organization's values line up with yourself. Um, you know, I think that, and you need to be true to yourself within the interview process as well. You know, I think that it's pretty common even outside of the sports field to not necessarily lie during the, uh, the, the interview, but to, I guess, say what you think that the interviewers want to hear. And I think that that's really where a lot of coaches go wrong because, you know, as I'm sure you know, as you go out through this interview process and you agree to different things, say that you're, you run, you typically run like a three, four, but um, you know, the coaches or the organization wants to stay with a four, three. If you're going into it and agreeing that you're, you know, going to work in a defensive scheme that you're not familiar with, uh, just because you want to get the job, you know, ultimately you're going to be judged upon what you agree on in the interview. So, you know, that's just a matter of staying true to yourself and, you know, I guess being willing to disagree and willing to, um, you know, not necessarily fall back away from your, uh, from your values and beliefs. So Brian, looking at the interview process today, and I know, um, you know, probably when you wrote this book, uh, there's been a lot of changes recently, just in the last few months, because of the pandemic, because of social distancing and, and you know, worries of bringing people in. But it's also opened up opportunities, too. So, you know, it may actually expand the area where you typically might search for a job. Uh, maybe you're willing now to look outside those lines a little bit because you don't have to spend, you know, all that travel time and the expense of getting there, etc. But the interview process um, and looking at it now, I guess, through through that traditional lens, but also then maybe we could get into, you know, some of the, I guess, updates you would say to, you know, how that's been affected by the pandemic. What, what kind of things, uh, what kind of advice do you offer there? Yeah. So I think that that's another thing as far as when you're preparing for the interview, just kind of knowing what you're going into and kind of what to prepare for. Cause I think that obviously, again, and this extends beyond the sports field as well, every organization has their way of doing things and their way of doing interviews. And so while for one coach, it might just be, you know, a couple hour uh, conversation with the athletic director and with the Dean of the school, you know, where the case of Stacey Collins, he was interviewing with like literally the entire university. He was work he was working with different academic departments, student groups, um, you know, different, uh, different departments within the athletic department. And then obviously working uh, with the dean as well. And then I think that for Stacey Collins as well, he had like an open like Q&A uh, from the community too. So it was a, a completely wide ranging process. And it's, it's really impossible for a coach or for anyone to have all the answers that they were looking for. So, you know, just being prepared for, I guess, more or less anything would be crucial. But in addition to that, you know, you have to be able to admit to not to having gaps in knowledge because obviously not everyone knows everything. And, you know, I think that what had often happened and athletic directors had told me this throughout the, the interviews that I had done is that, you know, one, a, a particular question had come up and the interviewee kind of stumbled and that kind of derailed the rest of the interview. They kind of just got in their head and, you know, they kind of just went downhill from there. So I guess, you know, going into it and just being prepared for what you're going to face. And then, you know, again, being, being ready to admit, you know, what you don't know, because obviously no one has the expectation that you're going to know everything. And a lot of these things you'll just learn on the job. So 
Uh, I think that those are kind of some of the key points when you're going through that interview process. I know in a section of your book, you, you cover what goes wrong in interviews and uh, there's always a lot to be learned from um, the, the mistakes and the failures. What are a couple of those ones that stand out for you? So far, far and away, uh, the most common failure, I guess, within interviews is a lack of preparation. So just not being able to answer uh, pretty basic questions. So on the field stuff, how you would handle different situations, uh, things of that nature, and just not, I guess, not knowing about the organization. I think that, you know, some people think knowing about the organization means, you know, you're wearing a tie that is the school's colors, but it goes far beyond that. And I think that, you know, most people do look beyond that. They want to know that you looked into the program's traditions. They want to know that you looked into the community, that they, that you looked into various aspects that you're going to be a huge part of moving forward and that they want to know that they can rely on you to re represent their organization and their, um, you know, or their university the way that, you know, that they want it represented. And so you just, again, you have to be prepared for um, things that go beyond the football field or, you know, whatever field it may be. Um, but then also, again, you need to be ready to answer questions as far as on field stuff as well, obviously. So after you get the job, there's always this whirlwind of activities. And we see this at the highest levels. There's going to be those huge press conferences, et cetera. But I think this applies even down to the high school level because you have an excited community and, and you know, kids and parents and community members who are excited about you being there and want to get you to know you, et cetera. So uh, that time after you've been extended the job and you have accepted the job, uh, what kinds of things do you have to deal with and what advice were you able to get in your research here? Yeah, so it's definitely a whirlwind right after accepting a job. Because I mean, obviously, not only does that mean you know you're taking on this new opportunity, it's, it generally means that you're uh, moving and uprooting to a different area. So uh, that is obviously its, its own sort of issues, especially if you know you have a family, if you have kids and things like that. But then on the actual work side of it, you know, again, to touch back to Stacey Collins when he had gotten hired as a head coach, uh, he was still in the midst of a recruiting period uh, at the school he was previously at. So he wanted to wrap things up there and, you know, finish out as well as he could uh, with that school. But then on the other side of that, you know, you do have to hit, hit the ground running on the recruiting trail to college level. You have to get going, um, you know, pretty much right out of the gate. And so, it's tough to kind of balance those because you don't, you know, you don't want to burn any bridges at your previous school, but you also don't want to be at a deficit moving forward. So um, beyond recruiting, again, like you said, there's the different community events and things like that. You'll have your press conference. And then uh, I think that that should probably be an area of your portfolio as well is, you know, how you would ingratiate yourself within a community and how you would uh, start to get yourself involved in this new community. So that's something to be continually preparing on and thinking of different ideas of how you can do that. Um, beyond that too, you know, there's different expectations that go on off the football field too. There's, you know, boosters uh, and things of that nature too. And then filling out a coaching staff, it's, you know, there's, there's really just an endless amount of things that uh, pretty, pretty much an endless list of things that uh, you need to adapt to uh, when you accept this new role. And obviously there's, the excitement of getting that role and landing it, you know, that's something that not a lot of people get to experience, but you know, that's, that's really when the real work of it starts. So especially for that first time head coach, uh, there's always going to be some unexpected challenges. You know, if you were used to being an assistant or a coordinator, uh, a lot of what you did was the X and O focus, but now you're stepping into this role. You're essentially the CEO of an organization. You have to do a lot of things. And, and uh, there are those unexpected challenges, even if you're you know, a veteran uh, of being a head coach, that uh, no matter what research you did with the program, you know, it's very, all of this is very dynamic. So how uh, do you meet some of those unexpected challenges? And, and typically in your research, what were things that seemed to pop up again and again? 
yeah. So, I mean, like you said, it's just, there's so much preparing that you can do, but ultimately you're not going to be able to really, uh, you know, duplicate that experience just by preparing. You're going to have to go through and live it. Um, you know, I think that one of the bigger things out of the gate is again, to not to really harp on this, but to have that network in place where you can, you know, ask some of your old, uh, some of the coaches that you've worked under in the past, you know, how did you handle the situation with the community? How did you handle this situation with a student athlete? Um, you know, how did you kind of prepare within your first 20, 30 days in the role? Um, you know, it, it really does take time as well. And I think that especially within a coaching community, there really isn't, I guess, enough leniency uh, to a certain extent of, you know, being able to have a little bit of time to adjust to new roles. So I think that, you know, one of the more common things that I had heard throughout the entire time is that it was, it was really like about a year until most people really felt more settled within their, within their new roles. Cause uh, like you had mentioned with, you know, taking on a head coaching position, you know, it is really like you're like a CEO, you know, you've got you're, you're managing with boosters, you're managing your own coaching staff, you're obviously managing your team, you're working with the athletic department, you're working in the community. There's so many elements that don't even involve football. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a point that a lot of people overlook as well is that, you know, obviously football coaches are, are committed to the game of football, but you have to be prepared to work so, so much outside of the actual sport itself that, you know, it's tough to really prepare a hundred percent for, but again, you know, to touch back on it, it's just, you know, you, you really do need to rely, rely on your network at that point and just kind of stay the course with your, with your beliefs and your values. And, you know, it's just a, a thing that takes time. Brian, I know you put a lot of work into this and talk to a lot of people. What were some of the, the key takeaways for you that especially you could pass on to our coaches who are listening? So, yeah, I think one of the major things, and again, we've touched on it quite a bit to this point, is that you really do need to work that network. Um, you know, it, it is an entirely relationship-based business. Um, the, the relationships that you make throughout your career are really going to make or break you. It's tough to to really kind of break out uh, without any of those relationships, even though, you know, you look at a, you look at a coach like Sean McVay, um, with the Rams, you know, you think that he's like this young guy, how could he have developed this whole network? But then you, you look into his actual, uh, his, his past and you see, you know, his father was working, uh, in professional sport or in professional football. And, you know, he had that kind of leg up. So, you know, obviously most people do not have fathers that work in professional football. So you're going to have to do the groundwork of, uh, networking yourself. And, you know, it is a little bit tougher and, you know, this is thing from personal experience as well. It's tougher. Um, within you know within the, the within the pandemic there's not many in-person events there's no there's not many clinics there's ca- not many conferences things like that where you know traditionally that's where you would do a lot of your networking but with that being said you know there is there is still opportunities you know with at least i'm in the state of michigan and uh high school football has uh currently been uh delayed throughout this time so you know you're looking at coaches who might have a little bit more time than they previously would have. So reaching out to those different coaches and, you know, seeing what you can do for them, seeing what you can learn from them, even just hopping on like a zoom call. And I think everyone is pretty much experienced with that. Now hopping out with them, talking to them for 15 minutes or so, you know, visiting sites like your own and seeing what you can learn. Um, but beyond that, you know, in your, in your conversations with them, and even as it extends into your student athletes and your conversations with parents and things like that, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that you really just need to be genuine with people. And that comes back to the networking aspect that you mentioned. It's not, you don't, people don't want to feel like they're being used or that they feel like they're being, um, you know, lied to obviously. So, you know, just being genuine in your conversation, I think in your conversations and your relationship building will be pretty huge. And, you know, that extends to the interview process as well, you know, being genuine with the interviewers, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. It's just going to work out overall. Uh, much better off for you kind of in the long run. So Brian, I know there's one last uh, piece that's included in your book. I think it's a valuable one too, because we all need to go through this exercise, but you did put together uh, a coaching philosophy template. Um, How did you come up with that or what was the the resource for you? 
Yeah. So a lot of that is just, you know, conversations that I had with coaches, you know, what did they include within their portfolio? And I believe it was Jerry Mack who, um, who had really pushed the idea of um, the, Jerry Mack, the offensive coordinator of Rice University. Um, he had really pushed the idea of developing this template of, you know, again, going beyond just athletics and showing that you're doing that research, you know, within the uh, template itself, you know, it, it includes research that you should be doing into your school, um, into the conference that you'll be working in, your own coaching philosophy, um, how you'll deal with different events with your student athletes, with parents, um, the guidelines that you'll set with parents and with the community. It's just pretty all encompassing. And it just really makes you think about, you know, why am I doing what I do? Why am I, why do I think the way that I do? And it, that going through that process and reevaluating you know, your values and your philosophies is really going to be helpful to you as a coach and your growth of it. Cause you know, obviously coaches are going to, going to continue to grow over time. And if you're continually reevaluating and trying to develop and trying to adapt to different trends within uh, your sport, you know, you're really going to be better off in the long run, whether it be in this particular job that you're working in or the next job. So even if you're not planning to move on to that next role, uh, within the industry, within the coaching profession, you really do need to continue to build this portfolio and reevaluate yourself at the end of every year and see, you know, what can I do differently to make myself better, to make my coaches, my assistant coaches better, and to make my team overall better too. It's just overall, it's just a good a good practice to uh, to look into every year. Again, coaches, the name of the book is "You're Hired: A Guide to Working in Sports." by Brian Arzeppa. That's R-Z-E-P-P-A. Brian, uh, how can our coaches connect with you and learn more about your work? Yeah, so obviously uh, Amazon is the biggest place to find the book. You know, you're hired a guide to working in sports. But yeah, beyond that, just find me on Twitter, on Instagram. It's just literally my first and my last name, uh, B-R-I-A-N-R-Z-E-P-P-A. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram. And yeah, I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have regarding the book, uh, you know, regarding working in sports, regarding networking, regarding writing a book, uh, whatever it may be. Feel free to send any questions you have my way and I'd be I'd be happy to answer what I can and I'd be happy to uh, send you to someone I might know um, if, I, if I'm not able to answer your questions. Well, Brian, again, thanks for uh, reaching out. I appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing all these ideas here. And uh, again, coaches, if you have questions, make sure you reach out to them. So, Brian, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Keith. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.